Welcome to The How of Business with your host, Henry Lopez, the podcast that helps you start, run, and grow your small business. And now, here is your host. This is Henry Lopez. Welcome to this episode of The How of Business. My guest today is Brian Park. Brian, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me here. I'm excited to be here. Looking forward to it. Brian is going to share his entrepreneurial journey. Very interesting. From graduating from the Air Force Academy to founding Footprints Floors, which is a nationwide full-service flooring provider. He's going to share that experience and and his guidance just in general on how to build, start and build a successful flooring business. If you want to receive more information about the Howa business, including the link to the show notes page or the show notes page for this episode and how you can continue supporting my show and receive workshop discounts, join my monthly group coaching session through a Patreon membership, just visit thehowofbusiness.com. Also, wherever you're listening to this episode, if you'll please subscribe, that way you don't miss any future episodes. So Brian Park is the founder and CEO of Footprints Floors. They're a full-service flooring provider based in Colorado, but serving across the nation. And under Brian's leadership, Footprints Floors has established an exceptional reputation by prioritizing the customer and promoting the best in people, products, and business practices which has enabled rapid growth in in over 160 territories. He currently serves as ex officio. Is that how you pronounce that? Ex officio member. Thank you. Ex officio member of the National Wood Flooring Association, the NWFA. Uh, He's on the board of directors and has received recognition as a distinguished 40 under 40 nominee by Hardwood Floors Magazine. Um, Entrepreneur Magazine recently named Footprints Floor as one of America's fastest growing franchises. Brian lives in Littleton, Colorado. Once again, Brian Park, welcome to the show. Again, yeah, it's it's good to be here. Glad to uh, share whatever knowledge I I have in my head, and uh, yeah, anything I can do to help, I'm always I'm always happy to help. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. I'd like to start at the beginning, though. I'm always interested in the journey, how people got to where they are today. You attended the Air Force Academy. Uh, knowing a little bit about the Air Force Academy, as I mentioned before we started recording, my friend lives, uh, actually, you can see the Academy from his house balcony over in the northern end of Colorado Springs. Was that a, usually what I see with young people is that's an aspiration early in life. But tell me about that. Why did you decide to go to the Air Force Academy? It, w- it was an aspiration early in life. I, I think it really just was a desire to serve. I I didn't have any kind of uh, military parents. You know, my grandparents were and World War II, but my parents were not in the military at all. So it was just, yeah, seeing football games, being part of it, just the opportunity to serve. I really wanted to do something with my life that was bigger than myself. And I I thought the military, at least in my 17-year-old brain, was an excellent place to do that. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed parts of the military. There's certain parts that didn't mesh very well with me. That might be a little bit of my story here today. But uh, yeah, I, I strongly encourage people to pursue that if that's uh, that's their desire. Yeah, I'd like to explore that because I suspect that maybe, I'm guessing here, and you're going to correct me, the entrepreneurial side of you maybe fought that incredible structure a bit. Is that part of it? Ex- ex- well, and when you're 17 and you don't even know you have an entrepreneurial side, mm. it's just kind of like, what am I going to do in life? And trying to figure out, well, I go get a good education, I get a good degree at a fancy college, and I you know, have a good uh, path that's set up to to make money. And that's what, you know, the world tells you to do. And it's not, there's really not a high school class that says, go be an entrepreneur. You know, it's, it's something I think you discover as you move into adulthood and start to figure it out. And yeah, the the whole, the entire military is set up to be anti-entrepreneurial. They're trying to squash that. It's like, here, here's what you do. And that's it. The, The part that I really didn't like was it's a very set, promotion scale, especially mm. in the earlier rankings. It's like two years of this with this pay. And then the next two years, it's this with this pay. And then at five years, you move up to this rank with this pay. And there's very little achievement or merit to it other than you get promoted. If you're bad at your job, then you'll just end up flatlining and not moving past a certain rank. But until you get into the, the colonel and general ranks, there's not a lot of merit applied to things in the military. And that bothered me. Cause I felt like I was very good at my job and it was hard to separate myself from the peers and get recognition and move up and the opposite of being an entrepreneur. 
Yeah, no, very interesting because I, I experienced that in the corporate world, but I really hadn't thought about it. How much more so that has to have been very oppressive feeling to someone like yourself, oh, somebody really. else dictating very specifically what your ceiling was, right? Oh yeah, all the time. So yeah, to get out of that oppression was was really a, a breath of fresh air. And that's when I really started to figure out, oh man, I like this whole, Yeah, I, I love the ability as an entrepreneur, There, there is no ceiling, there is no cap. I will make and I can earn and grow things as fast as my ability allows. Uh, and I love that because I have always found myself to be fairly competent. Um, so I, I can run pretty fast. Uh, and that's something I, I teach on a lot with our franchisees because most of them, if not all of them are coming from corporate backgrounds mm -hmm. and I'm telling them, this is a little different. This is you, you eat what you kill. And if you're not good at killing, then you're not going to eat. And you know, this isn't sit in your cubicle and get a paycheck for showing up. This is, this is a game of winning. Um, so yeah, two great points there that I want to touch on right quick, Brian. Uh, you know, first is this this confidence uh, to because because on the flip side of it is when we become business owners, then it's on me. I, I'm accountable. I you know it's only it's up to me whether I succeed or fail. Yeah, I could have some bad breaks here or there, but I have to have to want that responsibility and accountability, right? Yep, being and being willing to engage. I mm -hmm. I talk about you're no longer a spoke in a big wheel you know, one of many spokes, you are the entire wheel. And in fact, if one of your spokes mess up, messes up, it's your fault. Your mm -hmm. crew breaks something, your customer's mad at one of your employees. It's still your fault. Yeah, And that, you know, doesn't sit right with people that come from an employee mentality. It's, it's an ownership leadership mentality. And that's a, can be a rude awakening for people. Well said, well said. So what did you bring forward from that military experience? What do you still leverage? Do you think uh, in business today that you learned then? <laughs> Something I teach on all the time. It's just the ability to show up. It's it's this amazing, easy, simple sentence, show up and do what you said you're going to do. If you can accomplish those two things, like then, then you're off and going, uh, you know, the Air Force Academy's model or uh, motto is, uh, let's see, integrity first, service before self and excellence in all we do. And we have built a company model or motto that's very similar to that. It's we're just so it's integrity first. It's just do what you say you're going to do. And C.S. Lewis once said, and I think he might even have borrowed it from somebody else. So who knows how far back this goes? But it's integrity is doing the right thing even when when no one's watching. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've always loved that because I, I catch myself like, oh, you know, I, I might get away with this. Nobody would even know. But no, it's it's unacceptable. It's not right. I do believe in God and God is watching. So there is some of that, but at the same time, integrity, having integrity, isn't a, a choice on when I'm going to implement it and when I'm not, it's, it's an all or nothing thing. Either you always have integrity or you don't have integrity. It's an, it's an off switch on and off. So agreed. And, and that's, and we'll explore it more, but that's gotta be part of how you then have inculcated that into your culture to deliver on your customer promise. Yeah. Oh, exactly. It's something we we start. Everything starts with with having integrity. That's how we um, have confidence. That's how we sell. That's how we take care of our customers. It all starts there. If you take care of your customers, everything else takes care of itself. Agreed. Um. So you know, you've touched on it as we were exploring. You know what what drove you to to become a business owner? Uh, that need for control and not having that ceiling and be able to accomplish what you want to accomplish. Now that you've been a business owner for some time, what, what else does it provide you? What is it that it, that it gives you in your life? Uh, I mean, I could talk about flexibility of schedule and it, it has allowed a lot of opportunities to be home. I have three daughters and a wife and we're actively involved in ministry and theater and all kinds of stuff. So that, that's been amazing. Maybe my favorite part beyond my time with my family, which is definitely the priority is as a business owner, when you grow, you get to replace yourself with the, you know, the things you don't like doing, you get to get rid of. So, so over time, as I've grown my business and we have, we have 60 something people on staff, there's 1200 people involved in the business across the country. Day one, it was me doing floors and I was working six and a half days a week. My wife was answering phones, you know, balancing two babies and I was fine doing floors. It paid the bills, but then over time I was able to get off floors. And then I was able to just do sales, which I enjoyed more than doing floors and the hard labor involved in that. And then eventually it was managing sales. And then all along the way, just to be able to replace myself and really get to do what I, what I like doing 
And uh, we probably have all thought of this before, what you like doing are things that you're good at. So I, you know, the things that I'm good at, I get to do more and more of, which benefits the business overall, because that's my skill set. And it's probably a good place to have me. Uh, yeah, I think that's my favorite part of being an entrepreneur. I get to do what I want. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's fantastic. But but I'm glad you highlighted because people, I think, sometimes have this misunderstanding that they'll get to enjoy that from day one. That's not often the case, especially for most of us smarting, starting small businesses with limited resources. We kind of have to do a, a lot of the things that we don't want to do initially. And then if we grow it, we can step away from those things, right? Yeah, I think there's a get over yourself factor. There, it's in my definition of humility. Just humble yourself. Now, I moved furniture. I cleaned up overflowed toilets. I, you name it, I worked nights, everything I needed to do to, and it was, it was to feed my family. Um, mm -hmm. that was, that was really the motivation. Right. And then it just, it grew from there, but I don't think there was really any limits to things that I, I wasn't willing to do to get my hands dirty and, and get going. Um, and I see those hesitations cause I coach a lot of business owners now and there is those, ah, I'm not willing to drive that far. And oh, yeah. well, you know, that's not very fun. I don't like talking to to that kind of business or whatever. It's like, does it make you money or not? Then get, mm -hmm. get over yourself and humble mm -hmm. yourself and go do it. But I think it ties to the point you just made. I have to have a, a strong enough vision or a why or a purpose to drive me to do those things. Right. No, I, that I think when you come from a corporate job, your motivation is to keep your boss happy mm -hmm. and there's, there's management. And as long as, as long as they're all happy, we're good. And I think that's a hard transition oftentimes for entrepreneurs or people that are starting in business, whether they're entrepreneur by, you know, at heart or not, is they struggle with the why. Like yeah. it's no longer about somebody cracking the whip and making, now you are the motivator and you are the determinant of your paycheck, which I always loved, as I said before, but a lot of people just can't, can't self-drive that way. Um, and I would say that they're probably not entrepreneurs then, because I think entrepreneurs are, are self-driven at their mm -hmm. definition. Can people learn that or develop that, you think, Brian? Or do you think that's something we either are or are not? I think it's a trait you can strengthen, but I'm not sure it's something you can put into someone if they just don't have it at all to begin with. Mm -hmm. Um, but that I, I think a franchise model specifically can help overcome some of those shortfalling. Absolutely. Just because there is a framework, there is mm -hmm. a mechanism and a system like follow these steps and these will be the results. And so there are certainly non-entrepreneur types that are able to succeed to succeed in that kind of framework. Um, so starting from something from scratch is probably a little too much. Yeah, well said. Well said. I agree with you. That's been my experience as well. There's 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 a level of accountability as well. You have a peer network. There's, you know, you so you've got that guidance to to set you down the path. And then I, I agree with you. I think that it could be that it's latent within you, but you haven't developed it. Uh, but you kind of have to have some of that at heart, or it's it's not for you. Um, how did you end up uh, in the flooring business? <laughs> My dogs ate my carpet. <laughs> that was it. So I was, right? I was looking for a job, uh, gotten out of the air force. Um, and my wife and I went out to dinner and came home and we had three puppies for some reason. We, we, we liked puppies. My wife liked puppies and I love my wife. Uh, so we had these dogs that just shredded our carpet while we were out to dinner. And then we came home and discovered it. So we hired a flooring God. company to come in and you know, fix our, our hardwood floors. And we, we replaced the carpet that got torn up with hardwood floors. And I was watching the guy put them in. I was like, this is kind of cool. How much money do you make doing this? He's like, I don't know, hundred grand, 120. I'm like, I could, I could do floors. This looks pretty, pretty sweet. I was in my early twenties. So I was much skinnier and in better shape. And, um, and yeah. fairly, you know, me not mechanical, but handy with those kinds of things or. No, I really, it's zero handiness, very white collar really? background. I, mm. I, you know, I, I wouldn't say I love being handy, but I have good kind of spatial recognition. Like it makes sense to me. I see. It doesn't baffle me, but, um, it's not my, it's like, I don't know. I know guys that are like, Oh, I got a day off. I'm going to go like take my lawnmower apart and put it back yeah, together or like, do some woodworking or something like that. That's, that's you saw, me. you <laughs> saw the, the potential earning opportunity for you and your family. Yeah. And it was really, it's just a short-term fix. Like, Hey, I'm going to go 
do floors by day. I'm going to, I was a history major at, at the Academy, which leads to not many job opportunities. <laughs> uh, so I was going to go be a civil engineer because that's what the world tells you to do. I hadn't figured out I was an entrepreneur yet. Uh, and so, yeah, I was getting, getting an engineering degree. It was going to be a short-term fix uh, and stumbled into this industry really for the first couple of years with zero intention of going past a couple of years. You were working, you worked for somebody else initially. Is that correct? I did. Yeah. I worked, I called up the company that was doing our mm-hmm. floors and said, Hey, are you guys hiring? So I was a customer turned, turned crew. Uh, and so they brought me in and I would say they, they taught me the trade, but uh, my first day of training, the trainer no showed and didn't show up for two <laughs> weeks. So I actually was, teaching myself on people's floors. And my instructor was telling me over the phone how to do things. So, so you learned a lot about what not to do later. I was, oh, there's so much that I learned. Oh, yeah. I had lots of mess ups in those early days, but I wasn't afraid. So yeah. And then worked with them for a few years, 2008 hit, uh, mm. economy crashes, great recession. They stopped paying all of their employees. I was a W2 employee. They wow. stopped paying me. And I went for six months without a paycheck. Wow. Yeah. It was, it was about $35,000, $38,000 in W-2 pay that they owed me. Uh, and in November of 08, so going into the winter, we're a seasonal business. I had a, a two-year-old. My wife was eight months pregnant. Mm. I'm $40,000 in credit card debt uh, in a major recession. And they sat me down at an Arby's and let me go and said, we're not going to pay you. Good luck. Um, so I was needlessly to say, needless to say upset, but, uh, yeah, it, it really, and, and as, as Pete, your listeners are listening in on this and they're like, Oh, I don't know if I'm an entrepreneur and uh, this is all scary. Like even up to that point, even though I'd known, known the trade for a few years, I still had no desire to break off and start my own business to the point where I was willing to sit, at, you know, under the leadership of these guys without getting a paycheck. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't until they fired me. And I was unemployed and I needed to go find something in a recession that I finally started Footprints Floors and and made that decision. And it really came down to math. It was, I can go get a job at Home Depot for 12 bucks an hour and make X dollars per month, or I could do one floor in like three days and make the same amount of money that I would in 30 days at Home Depot. And so it doesn't make sense. I just need to go find a floor, like one floor a month and I'll make more money. Um, so that was really the catalyst to footprints floors was that, that math and, uh, it made sense. And so obviously I can do more than one floor a month. So I'll make two, three, 10 times the money that I would work in retail. Um, so yeah, so started That's footprints cool. floors, December 9th, 2008. It was just me and my wife in my garage. And it was, uh, you and what the, the vehicle you had, what did you have to go buy a bunch of equipment? <laughs> what, what did you do? <laughs> I asked those guys that owed me all that money. I'm like, if you're not going to pay me 35 grand, will you at least give me one of these sets of gear that's right. sitting idle because you don't have any crews working? And they said, you can have this one. It's at the repair shop, but it's been repoed because we haven't paid our $3,500 repair bill. So if you'll pay the $3,500 repair bill, then you can have that gear and you can have this trailer and so I, I got a little dinky 10 foot trailer and I got this busted up gear that I had to borrow 3,500 bucks from my father-in-law to get out of repo. Uh, and that was, yeah, me driving around a two wheel drive four uh, four runner in Colorado. That was wise. Um, pulling this, this junky gear and about four months into it, I get a phone call from the trailer leasing company <laughs> saying, Hey, these guys haven't paid the lease on this trailer. Uh, we heard you have one. I'm like, how about I just pay off the lease? How much do they owe you on this crappy trailer? Like, Oh, it's like five grand. I'm like, Oh, (laughs) wasn't it three grand to begin with? And they're like, yeah, they've never made a payment. And so now it's five grand. And so I was like, you could have the trailer back. I'll go buy a brand new trailer for half that that money. Um, They go, do you happen to know where those other trailers are at? And I go, well, I may know where those other trailers (laughs) are. (laughs) Cut me a deal there. Yeah, that's crazy. So were you thinking, though, back then, and I'm curious also as to the input you were getting from family or other people, this is just until I can land another job or or was it clear I'm going to go down this path of doing my own? By that point, it was clear I was going down that path. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd I'd really learned and this this might apply to all construction, but our business in general, definitely in the flooring world. 
there's very little integrity. There's very little ingenuity. There's a reason that construction has a bad name. It's, mm-hmm. it's people showing up doing half the work and disappearing. Yeah. And so I saw a, a giant need in the flooring industry to just simply like what I said at the beginning, just to simply show up and do what you say you're going to do. Uh, and I've been asked, I've done, I don't know, th- thousands or 10, 10,000 estimates and almost every one of them, they're like, why footprints floors? Why should I go with you over the other guy? I said, I do floors, you know, pretty, I think I'm pretty good at it. You know, there's other good guys too, but the difference is what I say is going to happen is going to happen. And I will put my own money behind it. So I will show up, I will call you back and I'll do, do what I said I would do. Uh, and people believe me. And then I, I stuck to it. And there was a lot of sacrifices, a lot of times when I could have been sneaky or gotten away with things. And I refused to, uh, I don't believe in karma, uh, but I, you can call it karma if you want, Mm -hmm. but it it comes back around. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was just part of who you were at that point in time. Let me, let me, let's go on a tangent for a second on that, because it's one of those challenges I observe with people when they're starting a business, when you're a solopreneur, when it's just, maybe it was just you and your wife. I have found that it gets hard to scale beyond that one person because you're trying to answer the phone. You're trying to get quotes back. You're trying to show up. You're trying to deliver on a job. How did you manage all of that? Did your wife help you with answering the phone? And we're talking about a lot less technology than we have available today back in 2008. So how did you juggle all of that so that you could show up? We had zero technology. Yeah. My wife's a superstar. She definitely took a heavy load for the first couple of years. And then we replaced her eventually with an employee, but uh, she answered the phones. She helped build the website. She did most of the writing. Um, she's excellent at customer service. And what it really did, it freed me up to go do floors and do estimates, which is really where we made money. The more floors and the more estimates I can do, the more money we make. And she realized that. And and we had a two-year-old and a a three-year-old and a one-year-old at that point too. So she was quite busy. We we would have crying babies in the background on the phone all the time. And customers actually loved it. They're like, They did it because they personalized it, didn't it? It made you guys really were locally owned, family operated. Oh yeah. I'd show up to estimates like, Oh, I heard your baby in the background. And like, Oh, I'm so sorry about that. They're like we loved it. Like, well, let me show you pictures. And then of course I sold that job. Yeah, um, So it was part of my sales pitch, I guess. Yeah. You embraced it instead of trying to pretend to be this big, you know, I see that a lot, especially nowadays we put up a website as we, and we try to pretend to be something that we're not. And I think we. it does resonate better when people uh, uh, realize and you're transparent about who you really are. Oh, I just, uh, yeah, I just owned it. Hey, I just started this business. I've been in the industry for the last few years. I'm good at what I do. I just love, love the chance, whatever, whatever you can do. I know. Let How me, did you first land some of those, their early clients? How did you do that? Did you work a list that you had? How, how did you get the word out? I walked neighborhoods with black and white flyers that I printed on my dinky little printer. Mm-hmm. So I printed out thousands of flyers, and knocked on doors, and put flyers up, paper cutter, and cut them in half. And my father and I walked neighborhoods in December and January in Colorado, putting flyers on doors. And that wow. was how we got going. That's fantastic. Yeah. So one vehicle, it was just you. How long did it take you before you could start to hire workers to help you and started to separate yourself, as you said, and then focus on sales? Really by probably April of 09, I was starting to bring in other crews. So it was only about four months in the first two months I did no work. So December and January really walked neighborhoods. I didn't have any jobs. Was that your expectation? Did you, did you give yourself that much runway or, or were you freaking out? Or what, what my was runway it? was zero since zero, we were $40,000 yeah. in debt. Uh, we'd also applied for a $10,000 loan from our bank that we'd been at forever and got denied. And we thought that was like the end of the world. Turns out that ended up being a blessing in disguise. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, we had no capital. It was just simply putting flyers. We had a call come in from a flyer. I did it. It was like a $9,300 job. For, and then we took that money and sank it into, into more marketing. Uh, and then we turned on like online marketing. At the time, it was called Service Magic. Mm-hmm. Now it's Home Advisor. Now it's called Angie. There's been a progression. Um, and then leads start coming in on there and, and really I was, I was pretty good at floors, but I was far better at sales than I was floors. And so I was able to then take and turn those, those opportunities into sales to the point by April, I was able to get two and three other crews going at the same time. So, so for the first two years of my business, I did a floor full-time myself each day. And then I would, I would go check on 
three other job sites each day as well. I'd leave my helper behind. He'd keep working. I would go check on the job sites. I would do estimates by evening and on Saturdays. And then I'd work half day Sundays prepping for Monday. And then I would do it all over again. And I was working, yeah, 70, 80 hours a week for almost two years. Two years. Um, And that's what it took to get it off the ground. And I was willing to do it. We put a lot of things in place that have have stayed and uh, are are core pieces of our business model to this day. Um, I couldn't do it again. I don't think I have the energy (laughs) in my 40s now, but uh, 20, 23 year old Brian had lots of energy, apparently. (laughs) Absolutely. No, no, I get it. I understand it. I've I've been there as well. This is Henry Lopez with a brief break from this episode to share a special offer from our new show sponsor, Zinch. Zinch has been providing fast and convenient financing solutions for small business owners since 2004. Running a successful small business requires developing partnerships, especially partners who can provide the financing you need to run and grow your business. That's why you need Zinch, a direct lender tailored to small and medium-sized businesses that makes loans simple, fast, and flexible. And Zinch can approve up to $250,000 in under two days. With Zinch, you don't have to wait months like you may have to for a traditional bank loan. Whether you're dealing with unplanned equipment repairs, a big bill you didn't expect, or the cost of expanding and hiring new employees, Zinch knows you must act fast, and their specialists will help you choose the best solutions for your needs. There are no commissions or third-party approvals, so Zinch can give you better rates, faster approvals, and keep your information secure. Get financing the easy way with Zinch. And for a limited time, Zinch is waiving your application fees for my listeners. That's a $250 value. Just visit financingthatworks.com to learn more. That's financingthatworks.com. Loans made or arranged pursuant to a California finance lender's law license. What were some of those those other early challenges, Brian? Things that that you know were unexpected in that first couple of years that you can remember? Uh, ups and downs of, of the market was, was trying. Um, so that was interesting and that kind of related to cash flow and really starting to game plan. And I would say most of my issues were all mental. And I, I think that's fair to say with what I see with franchisees often too, it's, it's a lot of self-imposed stress. I'm very much a goal setter. Uh, I, everything I do is goals. Like how long is this going to take me to shave in the morning? I'll like set goals practically. That might be a little over, over, but <laughs> obsessive, but we'll leave that alone not for another quite day to that level, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's getting there. Um, and when I wouldn't hit my goals, I would get really stressed out. And I remember I had to learn over time that these are self-imposed goals. Nobody's coming after me. You know, I'll just delay whatever the goal was by a month and it's going to be okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so it was a lot of that. There was definitely as a business owner, you, you come in wanting to please people and you quickly realize that the general public can be pretty nasty. Yep. Uh, and there's just a lot of people out there that don't want to be happy. And no matter what you do, they they just refuse. And if, if you own all of that and you take it upon yourself and your, your self-worth is based on everybody liking you, uh, you're going to have a lot of sleepless nights. It's going to be very difficult. So yeah, I, I phrase it these days when I'm training is, Hey, construction is a game of of a minus, if you're shooting for a double plus, like we, we all come from school where it's yeah. like, Hey, a plus is the goal. You don't want to miss, miss any questions on your math test or whatever business. It's impossible to be a plus because it's a, it's a moving target and it's subjective based on other strangers opinions of you. So while a minus sounds negative based on our backgrounds, it's actually phenomenal. And it plays out in business reviews. Hey, I'm a 4.6 out of five with 1200 reviews that's an A minus if you divide yeah. it. Yeah. Right. But that we would all say 4.6 with 1200 reviews is, is pretty, pretty darn good. good. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And so it's just, you're going to have people that aren't thrilled and you just need to move past it and go, you know, that's, that's going to be okay. I can't keep everybody happy. As long as I stick to my integrity, I took care of that person. I did what I said I would right. do. Right. You, you can didn't... sleep well at night knowing you did your best there in that situation, right? And they're mad that we were five minutes late on Tuesday. I apologized. I can't own that. That's just them. They gave me a four star because we were five minutes late one day. I'm sorry. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, listen, the challenge for us now as owners, uh, as business owners is that those angry people have a voice now that's been amplified by, by reviews, by online sites. Um, so, but, but are you saying that that was something that you were challenged with earlier? I know I was taking those things more personally and you learned oh, to separate sure. that. Yeah. Yeah. To just to, to let it roll off your back and, and have it put it in a healthy place. You do, you need to care. Yes. You can't care too far. So there's kind of a, a fine line in there's the middle. Balance, right? Yeah. It's really hard, especially for new business owners to come to that. And and I can talk about it a, a million times over, but until somebody experiences it and really learns it internally for a couple of years, it doesn't really make sense. Right. Um, yeah. and, and those and related to, you know, I think, I think also sometimes in these types of businesses, we have to accept and it's okay that some clients we need to say goodbye to, we need to let go of, right? They're, they're just not a fit for us. But related to that, in those early days in particular, one of the things I see that becomes a challenge is for small operators to take on jobs that they really can't deliver on. So were you careful to bid on stuff that you knew you could deliver on, or was it as opportunistic as anybody else? Uh, I don't like how you phrase that. <laughs> I, I was going to say the latter until you said like everybody else. Um, no, I, <laughs> yeah. I I definitely skew towards risk taker and hey I'll figure it out. Uh, I think that stems from my supreme, sometimes irrational uh, belief that I can figure out everything and, and do all mm -hmm. things. <laughs> uh, but you know, for the most part, it, it helped. I I see business owners struggle more from a profit revenue standpoint. Guys that are trying to be successful and feed their families, mm -hmm. I see more struggles coming out of the real restrictive, let me have everything figured out before I'm willing to take a step forward personality type. I see. Then I do a little bit of the gunslinger. Now, be a gunslinger, but responsibly, I think is the better way to put it. Know your craft, learn. And, and we put our franchisees in a position to succeed because we have so much information, so many people to talk to. We have a chat that they can run by the other hundred you know, people that are on this chat, 115 or something now. So they, they have every opportunity to find out the right answer, but to have it all figured out and be perfect before you're willing to inch forward, I, I think is a bad uh, trait for a business yeah. owner. There's oh, a I agree. gray, I agree. like, ah, it'll, it'll work out. And it does you know, 19 times out of 20. It does. And, and it, when it doesn't, 20, that's okay. But otherwise you paralyze yourself. Yeah, apparently. I'm. And when it doesn't, you throw some money at it, you fix it. Like, I'm sorry, we'll bring in another crew. We'll fix it and we'll move on. Yeah. But the other 19 times that it did work, I made far more money than I lost on the one time it didn't. Well said. Well said. All right. Since we're kind of on that tangent, let's let's talk a little bit about pricing because that's also the thing that happens early and, and then continues. You and you talk about this even on the website on your ability to run a more lean operation at foots uh at uh footprints floors. So talk to me about that, and especially in the early days and then to now. How did you not very easily slide into winning on price alone. Uh, that's a game that we'll never win. We can never win on price because we pay taxes and have insurance and um, are attempting to run responsible businesses. So in construction, the race to the bottom is a race that it, it, you would have, you have to be willing to not pay taxes or do any right. of those things. So we can't right. compete on that front. So, so really it becomes a, a value based proposition which is really where we hang our hat. Uh, we are very competitive with, in pricing, not the cheapest, but certainly cheaper than, than many. Uh, but we feel like we provide way superior value. And our value is found in our individual franchise owners and their, their knowledge level. They're present at the job sites every day, checking on things. They're communicating with their, their homeowners every day, constantly throughout the process. They do walkthroughs. You know, homeowners have their cell phone number that separates us from most of the box stores because they're just sending out a crew and there's no supervision. And if there's yeah. issues, you're calling a helpline in Georgia or something uh, versus presence. And then we separate ourselves from what we call the one man shows or the, the little guys, because we are a large company with a lot of resources uh, and integrity. And um, so I think we win on, on both fronts. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, that makes sense. Thanks for sharing that. All right, just kind of let's take it up a little level then on the flooring industry, the flooring business in general. If I'm considering this this business for myself, what we've touched on some of it, but what what would you say to people is some of the advantages of getting into this business? 
in, in flooring in general or yeah something? flooring in general yep uh this this could apply to the trades overall but then mm-hmm. also flooring as part of that you know you think construction it's it's not the sexiest of occupation paths you know nobody's excited to talk to me at the cocktail parties right you know Oh, you're in floors. That's cool. Oh, wow. Bye. Tell me about that. <laughs> yeah. no. And so if you can get over that, you know, there's a lot of money to be made. There's, there, there's definitely a, a great career path, hundreds of thousands of dollars kind of thing. Uh, I often talk, you know, who, who makes $200,000 a year and it's doctors, lawyers, mm-hmm. executives that have been in their job for a long time and business owners, and successful that's, business that's, owners. Yep. That's it. That's like, that's, that's the pool. You can talk professional athletes and actresses and stuff, but that's a very slim amount of people too. Um, And so this is, I think it's a great path to be able to, to, to earn and and to have the lifestyle that you want. We also have no brick and mortar, which is kind of cool. And a lot of trades are that way too, which means our overhead is, is next to zero. Our overhead is our own paychecks. And then we do some marketing and that's, that's about it. Um, we pay crews, we pay for material, but that's, those are, those are variable expenses. So they only mm-hmm. apply when we do when projects. Yeah. So it's very easy to cash flow our business. We get 50% deposits and jobs normally cost us 50%. So the deposit covers itself and the back half is usually our profit. So I see. it's, it's a very slick, succinct, very simple, but very profitable um, business model. And there's tons of opportunity. Tons of There's tons of opportunity in part. Uh, it is a fragmented industry to a big extent. And there are so many opportunities in so many markets. I got to think on this whole issue of customer service, of showing up, of reputation. Those things are there in a lot of markets. Is that right? Oh, that's yeah. That's why we became the largest company in Denver when we started 15 years ago. And that's why we have been slowly taking over markets everywhere we go. Because there's this giant hole in the market that that customers are, are just looking looking for somebody just show up to my house just do my project and be fair and don't rip me off and you know I'm a consumer I find painters and whatever for my own house and the guy shows up and he's fair and he's kind and he's normal I'm gonna load him up with everything I've got and I'm gonna tell every neighbor I've got and that's what we that's what we find when we're in yeah. these markets is like this is my new floor guy and I don't need to ever call anybody else because I, I trust him. Uh, and that's that's what we try to do. Yeah, yeah. And you alluded to this, Brian, at the beginning of this of this question. Uh, this really applies to almost every home service industry I can think of. I was talking to my wife the other day on a particular service we need at the house. It's like if if people would just show up, they, they would have a business, right? And that's the point you made at the outset. That's such a big part of it. I think in any business, the other point you made at the beginning that I think I want to come back to is the whole you know the business is out there, not here behind my desk. And that applies in a lot of these businesses, right? You were willing to get out there initially, and then you're still, I'm sure, your franchisees are out there in the community. You just said they're at the job sites. The business is out there for this type of business, not here in the office. Is that fair? Oh, exactly. Yeah, you got free time. I remember standing in the aisles at Home Depot in those early days when I was starving and babies at home. Like, I could be home, but I'm going to go stand at Home Depot, even though I'm not supposed to. And when (laughs) customers look confused, you know, I stared at the wall, and there's like, you know, we call them pumpkin patches. All the orange uh, aprons are all standing, hiding from customers somewhere. Right. I'll just walk up and be like, hey, you guys look confused. I own a flooring company. Is there anything I can do to help Love that? No. And I'd answer their questions. And then they'd always go, do you want a, co- you want a company? Would you mind coming to give us an estimate? I'm like, sure, I'd be happy to. And that's, those are free estimates and opportunities. And, I, you know, I'd scrounge up five or 10 of those and and a half a day sitting at Home Depot. But, you know, I, I use the word scrappy when I'm training. Just business owners need to be scrappy. Mm-hmm. You just figure it out. Figure out how to win. Figure out how to find money. I, you know, I can't give you all the answers. That's that's what scrappy is. Just get out there. Make connections. Talk. Do what you need to do to make it work. Well said. Well said. Where, where do, uh, for you and your franchisees, uh, generally speaking, where do most of your customers come from? What generates most of your opportunities? Uh, it, it, it evolves over time as, as they're in business. The first few years, we're buying a lot of estimates. It's a lot of online portals and uh, website and Google and, and that kind of stuff. Over time, businesses transition from buying estimates to referrals, previous customers, strong uh, SEO branding, those kinds of things start to transition over. My business in Denver is going on 15 years. 
uh, and it's, I don't know the exact numbers, but something like 70% of our estimates are ones that we buy and 30% are, are free ones, but it's something like 70% of our revenue is off of those referrals and previous customers and 30% off the ones we buy. Um, so if I'm understanding those numbers, those, those, those better jobs, those bigger jobs are coming from referrals. Is that what I'm understanding? Yeah. And our booking rates are much higher because they're, they're, you know, people buy from referrals and previous customers at a higher Got rate. It. Your close rate on those leads are much higher. Yep. And the average job size is higher. And average job higher. size. But I'm a firm believer, and this is, I guess, for new business owners. And I've heard this a lot. Like, I'm going to be a referral-based business. I'm not paying for marketing. I'm too good for that or something. My my philosophy on marketing is I'm going to pay a lot for marketing up front that then turns into referrals down the road. I promise you, I have far more referrals that, because I market than than the guy that doesn't. The best way to get referrals and previous customers is to have customers that can refer and yeah. become and become previous customers. So right. if you're just sitting around waiting for the phone to ring, you might be sitting around a long time. Let's let's make it ring. Let's control it, and then over time, it'll transition organically. In this industry uh, and other home services industry, you know the the guideline I've heard is about. 10% of projected revenues on marketing spend. Is that in line with what you usually recommend? Yeah. Uh, brand new franchisees might be slightly higher than that. In the sure. 12, and that's probably more to do with their sales ability than anything. They're just not mm, converting at, at the proper clips. Uh, and then the the veteran, more established businesses, we're talking three, five, seven years in, mm -hmm. they start to shift more towards even four or 5%. Wow. Uh, okay. Yeah, they're, and part of it's they've gotten better at sales, so their top line revenue is much higher. Um, but now they're not buying as many estimates; they're living and dying on on referrals and previous customers. Excellent, excellent. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, customer service. Let's touch on that again for a moment. How how are you achieving that? Do you think we talked about, you know, the the, the components of your integrity and how that that permeated the business from day one? But give us a couple of other examples of how you're executing on that across the system. Uh, I think it all starts with my, my, my mindset around customer service is this word smother. <laughs> and I, I use smother on purpose because it does have a negative connotation, but we want to smother our customers with communication. And when I think smother, it's, I'm going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing until somebody like cries uncle, like, okay, enough, leave me alone. And then we back off a step and, and we are right where we want to be with our communication with a given customer versus tiptoeing up to the line and never getting to the place where the customer feels it's necessary in there, you know, it's all up and down. It's, it's all a moving target with customers. Some, some will call a million times and they'll literally never call us back. That's how much communication they want. Mm -hmm. And others want to sit on the phone for an hour and a half every day <laughs> talking about their feelings and, and everything in between. And so you just, we smother and then we back off and that's really what we communicate all the way through our process. We, we maintain a, a you can call it a call center. We don't really like that terminology, but we answer all incoming phone calls for our franchisees with our customer service reps, CSRs. Uh, we don't, we call it a call center, but it's really like these it's CSRs a customer support are, center or customer support, uh, uh, whatever you want to call it. It's but not even those, a center. They're all yeah. sitting in their individual it, houses. They're all virtual. I see. Interesting. Yeah. They're all virtual. And so the cell phone ring to their living room and they answer and they put them on the schedule and um, it starts there. Uh, and then it goes to the franchisee being present through the whole process. They're there every day, checking on the customer, checking. And, and we teach our guys, when you go to check a job site, our desire is to just go look at the actual craft and then get out of there without talking to anybody. But what you really should be doing is checking on the emotional state of everybody involved, hmm. which is hard. Like we're contractors. Why do I care about emotions? Well, guess what? You're not a contractor, you're a business owner and emotions drive this entire thing because it's a people business. Yeah. How's your crew feeling today? Mm -hmm. You know, how's your customer doing today? Address those and then, and then move on, but don't, don't get in and get out. Well said, especially because you're going into people's homes. Um, all right. We've well, touched on quite a few of the attributes, I think, not only that make for a good entrepreneur, but but potentially a good footprints floors franchisee. Is there anything else that we didn't talk about that you look for that that if I'm listening, I'm thinking I could potentially be a good franchisee? Uh, I think it's somebody that's highly organized, potentially. I 
you know, there's not a single thing that we do in this business is overly difficult. You know, we're not doing brain surgery or, you know, fighting in court or something. Uh, but it's a thousand little tasks. And I think that's a lot of business businesses in general. And how good are you at balancing those thousand little tasks? Uh, can you can you take on more and more when they come up? Or do you like to keep everything nice and small? I only want to do 10 balls at a time because that's all I can handle. Not 11. That's where I draw the line. 10 only. Whereas I think an entrepreneur has the mentality of only 10. Give me 100. Oh, 100 was easy. I'll do 200. Throw them in. Like, and even when you feel maxed out. Somebody comes along is like, hey, I got another job next week. Can you do it? And you're like, eh, not really, but sure, let's figure it out. Right. You know, and it's just, you go figure it out. And that, so I think that mentality is very helpful. Uh, emotional toughness, that's a really hard, hard one to identify in people. Mm-hmm. But I think it's necessary as a business owner. And we've touched on some of the reasons why it's, you know, not everybody's going to like you and you got to, you got to be okay with it. Um, yeah. I think those are, are kind of the key things. Yeah. I, I've always had a, a very forward thinking um, aspect or personality trait to myself. And that's, I think, served served me well. Um, it's the ability to not, you, you got to be able to operate in today and get the job done because that's what's paying the bills. Right. But everything needs to be oriented properly towards a future goal at the same time. Mm-hmm. So ideally, you're accomplishing two goals. Remember, I'm a huge goal setter. So it's like, hey, we're going this way. And today's tasks are feeding into that big picture goal. If today's task doesn't feed into my big picture goal, then I'm not doing it. I'm going to figure out something else. I'm not changing my end goal. I'm changing my today operations to meet my end goal. Yeah, that makes um, sense. To be in alignment with that. And that's, that's the key. Yep. All right. What have we not talked about that you wanted to uh, to share with us about Footprints Floors from a prospective franchisee perspective? What, what have we not touched on? I, I mean, obviously we could talk for hours, but w- what else do you want to share as to why somebody should consider a franchise? Uh, I think it's important to say that we're, we're actually not looking for people with construction backgrounds. Of our 85 franchisees, probably five of them have any kind of blue collar construction background to them. Um, we're really looking for kind of the the corporate America washouts. That's a lot of our franchisees, and they've proven to be extremely successful. Um, I think it's a great opportunity to get out, get out of the cubicle, start to work for yourself, have flexibility in your schedule. I, I this is kind of a flooring joke, so maybe it won't make as much <laughs> sense to you. But you know, I've I've often said that I can teach adults about flooring, but I can't teach floor guys how to be an adult it's, it's too late. You know, if they're in their forties and haven't figured out how to set alarm clocks and work bank accounts, then uh, it's too late. Agreed. So yeah, I'm looking for adults that are eager and hungry adults, meaning responsible integrity based individuals uh, that they want to learn a craft. And I love teaching and I, I think I'm pretty good at it. And I'm happy to share everything I got. That's, that's really my passion in life. Here's, here's all my knowledge. What are you going to do with it? Yeah. Um, this is a business you're expecting people to be involved full time or can it be done in any way passively? What's the expectation? It, it is full time, uh, although we do have a number that uh, have kind of a general manager running mm-hmm. the day to day. But it, it does still involve quite a bit of oversight from the, the business owner. As okay. Well. And yeah. overall investment range, what are we talking, uh, you know, that that's in, would be in the uh, FTD? What's the range? Yeah, FTD. I think it's sixty-eight thousand for for one territory for the actual um, uh, franchise, franchise fee. Franchise fee. Yep. So uh, I don't. It's in the FTD. It's like okay. seventy-five or something for one, and then two's about one hundred and ten or something like that. And that's generally where most people hang out. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's all in our twenty twenty-three FTD. Excellent. For, for anybody who's thinking about the flooring industry and perhaps even a franchise, but just about this industry in general. And really about any business, what's one key takeaway that you want for us to take from this conversation? I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to for business owners. Uh, I think that fear holds a lot of people back. And I would encourage people to get over that that fear, talk to people, because it's, it's worth it. Now, I will say that, and this is a unique thing coming from the co- corporate world, it's different. Your first year of owning a business, you will work the hardest you've ever worked. And you'll make the least amount of money that you've probably made in a long time, uh, which is counter to what you're used to. It's like, oh, I work harder and I make more money. Uh, starting a business is the opposite. I worked my hardest and made the least. And then year two, 
you know, all that effort starts to pay dividends. And I worked a little bit less because things just got naturally easier. I got pieces in place. I found good employees, whatever it is. And I made more money. And then year three, I worked less and I made more. And I can say after doing this for 15 years now, I actually work way less today. Don't tell my franchisees this, than I did 15 <laughs> years ago. That's more because I worked so much in those early days relative to today. Yeah, you and made I make that investment. Yeah, and that, but that's what it takes. I think that is a misconception sometimes that people don't get. Because I think in part of it, Brian, is that mindset that we have to shift from trading dollars for hours to I'm investing in building an asset here. Oh, exactly. If you come into this with an employee mindset, it's like, I worked less at my last job and I made more money. Why am I doing this? And they stop at that instead of going, hey, I'm not doing it for today. Because if I was doing it for today, yeah, it's a losing proposition. But if I'm doing it. it for next year and two years and five years, and I'm doing it for my kid's college fund and I'm doing it so my wife can stay home or whatever it is, then it completely shifts motivations and it gets you out of that, that poor thinking, I think. So I, I would say that's my my takeaway for people is plan on it being hard, plan on it being a long marathon, not a sprint. And you're not going to see those results for a while. Well said. We have to make sacrifices. We have to invest. We have to think longer term. As you articulated earlier, it has to be in alignment with those longer term goals. Otherwise, you shouldn't do it. Uh, where do you want us to go online to learn more? Ah, uh, Footprintsfloors.com. Top right corner is the franchise button. Click on that. There's there's tons. There's so many videos and all this we, we hired a fantastic company I, to do all of this. They're, they're great. So there's so much literature out there. Yeah, there is a lot of content on the website. Excellent. Brian, thanks for taking the time to be with me today with sharing, being transparent and sharing your knowledge and experience. I appreciate you taking the time to be with me today. Oh, of course. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is Henry Lopez. And thanks for joining us for this episode of The How of Business. My guest today again was Brian Park. I release episodes every Monday morning. You can find us anywhere you listen to podcasts, including our YouTube channel and at our website, thehowofbusiness.com. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to The How of Business. For more information about our coaching programs, online courses, show notes pages, links, and other resources, please visit thehowofbusiness.com.